Hey, welcome back once again, all you gonna be CISSPs. I am Colin Weaver. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day, where I bring you two questions each time to help you get ready to pass the exam. Hopefully, answer them right. Here comes question number one. All right, so a new admin in your enterprise has come to you with a question about an entry that she discovered in the Etsy host file on a user's Ubuntu workstation. The entry reads evilapp.evilsite.com, scary, and followed by the IP address of 127.0.0.1. My question to you is, which of the answer choices that I list should you say or tell the admin? Click pause, decide which one's right, then we talk. All right, choice number one says that the entry is a null route to the host specified. No. Okay. Um, the host file is not used for the creation of routes. Um, so that is definitely not the right answer. It kind of swirls in the universe and maybe what you were trying to accomplish, but you're going about it the wrong way if that's what you were trying to do. So definitely not the correct answer. How about it is a DNS sinkhole entry, oops, I guess probably not a DNS entry, but it is a sinkhole entry to help protect the Linux system. Uh, this is actually the right answer. Um, it's really not necessarily the best way in the world to do this, uh, particularly at an enterprise level. But what you've got here is a situation where there's a bad you know, host name, you know, evilapp.evilsite.com. And what you don't want to have happen is you don't want a user who's using this computer to somehow be tricked into going there. Because if they were to click on a link that points to that location, or if they were to run some software that had some Im embedded stuff in it that was going to go and retrieve something from that location, because it's just a host name, the default behavior is for this computer to reach out to its resolver, which is a fancy way of saying DNS, or as, as a resolver to DNS, as I should say, um, and get resolution for evilapp.evilsite.com, which is going to resolve, in theory, to the correct IP address. By putting this entry into the host file, what happens is, is the majority of systems, uh, by default, be they Linux, Unix, Windows, Mac OS, they all tend to check this host file before they actually go and check DNS. So in this particular Ubuntu workstation, what's going to happen is, is if they try and go to you know, you open a web browser and go to HTTP, you know, evilapp.evilsite.com, it's going to resolve to 127.0.0.1, which is, of course, loopback. So it's going to resolve to himself, which means he's not going to be able to actually connect to that actual evil website. So that is very much geared towards trying to protect this workstation. The problem with doing it this way is that it does not scale at all. If you didn't want people in your enterprise going to evilapp.evilsite.com and you were trying to do so by adding individual entries to the host file, um, I hope you only have four computers. Because if you have a whole bunch of computers, ten, hundreds or thousands or more, then it's going to be a really sucky day. So definitely not the best way to do it. DNS and a DNS sinkhole would actually be one of the many ways that you might actually go and accomplish this. To go and create a zone file in DNS that points to uh, you know, evilsite.com and then you know, create an entry for evil app and then just black hole it in DNS. I, I tend to say black holing or sinkholing. I think different people use different terms. Uh, I think sinkholing is the more industry recognized term, but I always tend to say black holing, but uh, tomato, tomato, I guess. But you know, that's the idea here for going and doing that. So that is the right answer in this scenario. Oh, and one other note on that is that here it makes it look like we're using this for the forces of good. Uh, like we're trying to go in and use this host file for a positive reason, which is true, and this is one way that we can use it for a positive reason. Keep in mind, though, that an attacker can do the exact same thing, but right back to you. If somebody gains control of this computer, there's nothing to stop them from going in and putting in an entry that points to, say, good things, and black holing those or sinkholing those. For example, um, if let's say you have a, an antivirus update server that this computer checks with on a regular basis. If that's, you know, avupdate.avproduct.com, you know, then you can go in, the attacker could go in and basically black hole that. See, avupdate.avproduct.com points to 127.0.0.1. And in that circumstance, that means that you're not going to get any antivirus updates anymore. Because every time your antivirus software tries to resolve that host name to its IP address, it's going to resolve to loopback. And so you'll never actually talk to the AV server again. 
So the host file is a, is, is a powerful yet dangerous tool, and it ju just depends on who's able to put their fingers and tethers into it that's actually going to have that power. Uh, certainly, you don't want uh, would-be attackers getting into it, so it's definitely a, a, a precious file, to say the least. Choice number three on the list says you should tell that admin that the system has been compromised by an attacker. Um, no, uh, and nothing about this is an indication that the system has been compromised. Uh, entries in host files, for the most part, should always get your attention, unless you're an organization that makes extensive use of them. Uh, lots and lots of organizations don't, but if something is in a host file, you should be going, what's that? Why is that there? Who put that there? Um, and it should be very tightly controlled. But again, because this is pointing to something that is potentially evil and uh, sinkholing it that way, then it's not an indication of compromise. And then the last answer choice, again, me making stuff up, uh, says that it's an entry that forces uh, traffic to be routed out the 127.0.0.1 interface in order to uh, get to that destination. Uh, people who are networking people are gonna look at that and go, dude, that makes absolutely no sense because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, one, 127.0.0.1 is not an interface, it's an IP address. So uh, two, we don't typically route things by their host name out an address. I could route it by its IP address out an interface, but I'm not gonna route it by its host name because uh, the host name is still gonna have to be resolved to an IP address. And that's really what's getting routed. So definitely not the right answer. I just put that in there to try and distract you. Um, so question number two. For 802.11 wireless LANs, which of these items that I'm gonna show you is a feature shared by both WPA2 PSK and WPA2 Enterprise. I'm looking for the thing that both of them have in common. So take a look at those answer choices, think it over. When you got the right answer, click play, and as always, we'll talk it out. All right, how about choice number one, that both use server-side certificates for authentication? No. WPA2 Enterprise might use server-side certificates for authentication, depending upon the implementation that you go and make use of, like protected EAP or uh, EAP TTLS or EAP TLS or something like that. But um, under no circumstances with WPA PSK do we see the supplicant, which is the, the client, or, um, going in and making use of certificates, nor do we see the server going in and making use of certificates with WPA2 PSK. So that's not the right answer. Choice number two says they both support 128-bit AES CCMP. Yep, that is definitely the correct answer. Uh, in fact, 128-bit CCMP or AES CCMP is by standard the only um, implementation of AES that's supported. Now you may have a vendor specific solution that goes in and does something different, but the standard is just 128-bit AES. So at least that's where we are as of today. Um, time will tell where things go in the future. But that is the right answer. That's what we're looking for. Choice three says that both support WPA, or excuse me, Wi-Fi protected setup, WPS. Uh, no, WPS is supported by WPA PSK, but it is not supported by uh, enterprise implementations. So, and we could have a long conversation about why you wouldn't want to consider using it even for your pre-shared key implementations too. So, uh, although it still is. So, but not the right answer. Next choice. Both use RC4 to provide integrity for data frames. RC4 is an encryption algorithm, which means it's a mechanism of confidentiality. RC4 is not an integrity algorithm. Uh, more so, RC4 is not used by WPA. RC4 was used by web, but not by WPA. So all kinds are wrong in that answer choice. So I hope you didn't pick that one. Last choice on the list says that both can only be used in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range. Uh, that is an inaccurate statement. Uh, they can be used in the 2.4 gigahertz um, and the 5 gigahertz range. Uh, both are supported and defined by standard. And, or you can use both simultaneously with you know, different transmitting radios. So, uh, no. It is done. Two more questions complete. If you like them, awesome. Like, love. There's no love button. There's only a like button. So click like twice, I guess. But um, that's it. Next time.